صباح الخير جود مورنينج ايفري بادي My name is Raghi Dadargham. I'm senior diplomatic correspondent and columnist for uh, the London-based Arabic daily Al Haya. I am based at the United Nations, and I am most honoured to be uh, in the company of such distinguished panel. And I am uh, sure you all know this is on the record, which means uh, my fellow journalists are going to be rather happy because I think my panelists are going to give us great news, or news anyway. <laughs> As you know, the title of this session is Stability in the Broader Middle East, Who is Taking the Lead? And uh, we are going to be aiming at this, uh, uh, in this one hour to discuss what are the regional responsibilities. A lot of people speak about the United States' role in the region, whether it's negative role or a positive role, uh, an interventionist United States. What if the U.S. becomes isolationist? What if the U.S. says, well, I'm leaving? Who takes the lead in terms of maintaining stability? Do we do this in a collective regional manner, or do we go out and fight it out as uh, is happening in many parts of this world, in this Middle East? Or uh, is there going to be a regional leader? This sort of, uh, these sort of questions are going to be put to my distinguished panel here, and I would like to introduce them. Um, we have, of course, we have President Karzai, uh, Hamid Karzai, President of Afghanistan. We have, uh, of course, His Excellency Sheikh Salman Al Khalifa, Crown Prince of Bahrain. We have with us uh, Prime Minister Shaukat Aziz of Pakistan. We have, of course, His Royal Highness Prince Turk Al Faisal of Saudi Arabia, Foreign Minister of Iran Manushar Muttaki, and the Prime Minister of our host country, uh, Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Bahid. And so, with this, I'm going to start out with my first question to. President Hamid Karzai, um, your country was the first to be to, to feel the force of the huge changes affected in the international political arena brought about by 9/11. Despite much progress, your country remains, Mr. President, in the headlines around the world for the wrong reasons. What is going wrong, and what are you doing about it? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, fortunately, in the case of Afghanistan, intervention from the international community brought us uh, freedom from uh, an extremist occupation, from terrorism, from a very intense, obscure and test rule the consequence of which has been the return of 4.7 million Afghan refugees, mainly from our brotherly neighbors, Yunnan and Pakistan, the return of Afghan women back to public life, to politics, to economy, to social issues, uh, the return of uh, parliament and presidential elections, a much, much improved economy, uh, to give you one example, uh, Afghanistan's infant mortality, which was uh, among the highest in the world, uh, has declined. In other words, we have now 40,000 Afghan babies having a chance to live each year for the past two years. Uh, children have returned to school, uh, reconstruction is going well, thousands of kilometers of road have been reconstructed or constructed. Uh, Afghanistan is represented now all over the world. These are the positive developments. We do unfortunately continue to suffer uh, from attacks by terrorists. We do lose uh, precious human life uh, in parts of the country uh, the extremists, the terrorists try to attack schools, children, education especially, health services especially. The problem is continuing uh, in that sense. Now if you ask me 
whether I was happy with what Afghanistan has experienced in the past five years, I would say yes, I'm very happy. If you ask me if I have uh, a sorrow uh, over not achieving fully peace for the Afghan people, yes, that is a matter of concern and it's something that we continue to work on with our neighbors, to continue to work on with the Islamic world and with the international community. Now, we would have not been able to achieve in Afghanistan what we got in the past five years without the presence of the international community and without, in many instances, the cooperation of the neighbors. So the neighbors and the international community's combined efforts in Afghanistan enabled us to return Afghanistan back to its people. And I hope this cooperation in particular with the neighbors will enable us also to end extremist violence in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, will do many follow-ups with your, uh, to your uh, interesting <coughs> answer because for us watching from the outside, it looks like you painted a very pretty picture, although it looks to the outside world not that pretty. But I will get back to you on several details. And if I may move to uh, Sheikh Salman, uh, how, how does instability in the wider region reflect on a country like Bahrain, a small country given the size of your neighbors, sitting in the Gulf? You have right now Iran and Iraq. Iran as a potential problem for the region from the fears of, of possible clashes and Iraq potential problem in case it disintegrates, hopefully not, but uh, what, what, what uh, contributions can you make to make things a little better? I think that question deserves a answer that takes into account a number of realities. Uh, first and foremost, I think it is probably uh, unrealistic to assume that if not the United States, other international powers would not be involved on a global arena. However, uh, as responsibility has been passed down uh, from uh, the United States to the regional actors uh, in the region, uh, primarily, I can point to Saudi Arabia as taking a much more active role, uh, something that we support and something that we are part of. It behooves us uh, to remember that nothing can be done without the full support of the regional players. Mm -hmm. So as we watch uh, the, the region, and we are very concerned by what is happening in Iraq, uh, there is, of course, the possibility of uh, the instability uh, reaching a critical mass and the country disintegrating. However, we must support the current government in its endeavors to secure a better future for its people. Um, we must also realize that as regional players, we have a role to play in order that we lead from within. So if we are to lead from within in the case of Iraq and try and provide a platform for all of the parties to get together and resolve their differences, and also, uh, uh, with uh, due respect to Iran, uh, to urge and encourage uh, our uh, brothers across the, the sea in doing the right thing and trying to find ways of working with the international community, yet at the same time preserving uh, the sovereign right of the Iranian people to uh, develop their own technology in a peaceful and transparent manner, then I think we can achieve the success that we seek. And uh, in Bahrain, we are a small country, uh, so we are quite sensitive to all of the winds of change uh, that blow across the region. But thankfully, uh, we have a spirit that lets us attempt to transcend uh, these different stresses. And we have uh, good support uh, from all of the political actors within the country. And to be uh, short about it, I think uh, we must forge ahead and continue to build on the successes of our own 
domestic political reform and economic revival. So, uh, in short, uh, while one must watch what happens, uh, one must take responsibility for one's actions, one must endeavor to um, achieve the best that they can, even in difficult circumstances, and one must uh, always work towards the, uh, the betterment of those around them. Um, interesting, because in the Gulf we are witnessing somehow a way uh, of competition for stability or for, for resources for stability that are more economic than in a, in a way to surmount and to, to, to deal differently with the political instabilities of the region. And I would, I'm looking forward to a further exchange with, with you, sir. Uh, Prime Minister Aziz, um, you heard what uh, President Karzai said. Uh, um, that he, it, it, what does it look to, to, to you from Pakistan right next door? Uh, he spoke of the regional players and neighbors helping out. Um, we're not hearing that much uh, harmony going on right now between Pakistan and Afghanistan. So uh, what worries you about the situation? What is your role and, and, and thank you ma'am and, and, and please tell us if, yes. if, if I'm wrong and or the president is right <laughs> the president is always right Good. he's a neighbor and a friend and uh, you know in life we have to learn to live with our neighbors and uh, if there is one country in the world which wants a strong stable vibrant Afghanistan it is Pakistan and the reason is that no longer can borders hold back influences from the region. So all of us have to think regionally, collectively, and of course individually. We all have our sovereignty and territorial integrity to protect, but we have to look across to see how we can work together and help. In any conflict situation, if I may generalize for a second, ma'am, in any conflict situation today around the world, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's our part of the world, whether it's anywhere else, we need to follow a few basic principles. One, we must pursue the policy of inclusion and not exclusion. In every conflict, there are visible and invisible stakeholders. We must bring everybody to the table. And we must do that because very often we have seen the high cost we've all paid for exclusion. And whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Palestine, whether it's Iraq, whether it's Lebanon, they are visible and invisible stakeholders who must be engaged. In terms of Pakistan, we are a peaceful country. We want to live in peace. If you look at our neighborhood, it's very interesting. Pakistan, as everybody knows, a country of 160 million people, one of the fastest growing economies in Asia, which has doubled in size in five years. This Pakistan, we have India as a major neighbor, a good peace process, a lot of dispute resolution, conflict resolution, and more to come. With China, which is another neighbor of ours, a strategic partnership. With Afghanistan, a, shared, a sense of shared objectives. If we both do well, if Afghanistan does well, we do well. Yeah, let me give you a little example, supporting what President Karzai said. About six years ago, our trade was hardly $50 million a year. Sorry? $25 million. Today it's $1.3 billion. So if they do well, we be and most of the trade is from Pakistan to Afghanistan. So we benefit, everybody benefits. Then we have Iran. Iran is a major regional uh, country, a major uh, influence in the region, and we are now building pipelines with them. Pakistan, Iran, India. We call it the peace pipeline. We are linking... Because in the world of tomorrow, three things will drive success or failure. Energy security, food security, water security. And we all have to work collectively to achieve these uh, in, a ma in a fashion which will help improve the life of the people. And lastly, we, we are sitting in the Middle East today. This is the Middle East Forum. The single most important issue is the Palestinian issue. The Palestinians must get their rights their life must be improved and they must see a light at the end of the tunnel. They must get, they must get a sense of hope. And may I say that all of us must recognize that no matter where we are located, physically or otherwise, if the Palestinian issue is, is core to stability in the world, 
it is core to creating a sense of accomplishment and removing a sense of deprivation. So we have to move away from photo ops to a step-by-step -step process which will re result in tangible improvement. The Palestinian people must see that tomorrow will be better than yesterday. And this, even as far as Pakistan, we feel this. So it affects the whole world, and we have to work together to achieve this. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, President Turkey, Saudi Arabia uh, seems to have embraced that regional role that, uh, uh, that Sheikh uh, Salman was talking about as a key player in the region, trying to resolve many of the region's problems, including the Palestinian issue with the Arab Peace Initiative. Obviously, uh, the, the Riyadh summit is the one which relaunched the Arab Peace Initiative, so there is an Arab Peace Plan on the table. Of course, you've been trying to also have a very good conversation with Iran. Uh, what has changed, what has led to the change of policy? We're not used to a Saudi active role, public role in the way that uh, you are playing it. What, what, uh, what are you hoping to do in the next couple of months? And not to, not to, be, uh, not to forget your role also, which is a leading role on another conflict, which is Lebanon. Let me start by saying that um, what you just said is half right and half wrong. I'm always half right and half wrong. <laughs> the, uh, definitely uh, King Abdullah has uh, uh, invigorated the um, contacts and the whole aura of trying to accomplish um, peace and, uh, and prosperity not just within the kingdom, but within the region as a whole. But his activity and his invigoration comes from a long history of engagement by Saudi Arabia in the affairs of the region from the time of King Abdulaziz uh, forward. And uh, it's been the, uh, the, the burden in some cases, but mostly the duty of, of the kingdom to try to act as a unifier within the, uh, the region, not only uh, because of personality issues, but more importantly because Saudi Arabia holds the two holiest places of Islam within its border, uh, because it is the, uh, the uh, birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the message of the Prophet Muhammad since uh, it, it came down with Gabriel uh, more than 1400 years ago. And hence, that sense of, of duty and history obliges the leaders of the kingdom uh, to engage and to try to bring uh, people together. Uh, as uh, Prime Minister Aziz said, uh, exclusion has been the bane of uh, the problems in our part of the world. And uh, inclusion is the solution to all of these problems, whether it is social, economic, or uh, political. And so um, the kingdom is going to continue to be that uh, engager in, uh, in inclusion, whether it is in Lebanon or Palestine or Iraq or any of the other issues uh, that deal with the area in Afghanistan. And, and equally importantly, I think, is the economic contribution that Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states are making to the whole region. Uh, as you know, uh, remittances, for example, from Saudi Arabia to the rest of the world um, are second only to those from the United States in, in global numbers. That is more than $15 billion a year are sent outside Saudi Arabia by those who work from in Saudi Arabia to their homes in, in other countries. You can imagine the impact of that kind of of financial uh, uh, contribution to the societies where those monies are, are going. And also the kingdom in its uh, economic growth and, and uh, business growth uh, brings a lot of business uh, from outside the kingdom. Uh, so you have a centrifugal 
effect of the, the Saudi economy uh, contributing to neighboring economies and as far afield as South, Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent and Africa and other places within the Arab and Muslim world. And I think one of the things that uh, is equally important, and I'm now I'm speaking, uh, of course, as I have been before, as, as uh, an Arab citizen, is we as Arabs and, and Muslims have to take our fates in our own hands. We are the ones who are responsible for our future. And it is unacceptable as an Arab and Muslim individual to see Arabs and Muslims killing each other. Whether it is in Palestine or in Iraq or in Lebanon or in Afghanistan or anywhere in the world. It's a shame that we all must face this, this disease that we are afflicted with that we point our, our, our wrath and our anger at our fellow Arabs and Muslims more frequently and more uh, in a, a more deadly manner uh, than we do at our enemies. And it is about time for all of us as Arabs and Muslims to stop doing that. Thank you very much. Um, um Uh, Foreign Minister Muttaqi, Iran is, of course, of growing influence in the region, particularly in the last two, three years, and it's a, it's a very important regional player and international player as well. But you are receiving a great deal of criticism for your influence on stability in the region. Some think Palestine, some think Iraq, some think Lebanon. You are aware of these criticisms, I'm sure. Would you please address them? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. When we are talking about the stability, uh, we are talking about the region which has faced with several wars during last several decades and still is facing with crisis and Iran is in the center of these crises, either in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Lebanon, and Palestine. When we are talking about stability in this region, means world is waiting to receive daily more than 70% of its need to oil and gas from this region. When we are talking about stability, it means the people and the nations in the region would like to live in peace be secure and have a stable region. In our understanding, there are, and at the same time, when we are talking about the stability in this region, directly or indirectly, we would like to say that there is no stability in the region. For this, circumstances, in my understanding, we have to count in three levels the reasons and the causes. In the global and international level, in the region's level, and then in national level. In the global level, I do believe that either in the field of not efficiency of the internationalized or international organizations within the last 60 years, or they are working based on double standard political approach, and in one word, not following the justice in the international level. If we translate or have some interpretation in the economic field of this political situation in the world, we have to say the instruments 
international in instruments, monitoring, and financially, has no any good perspective in its history of work. If we look to, the, the, to Latin America, we will see that there was no a good approach based on justice for the situation in that country. All the guides and recommendations took the nations in that region to be committed for hundreds of billions of dollars debt and the current economic situation. And in our region, <clears throat> if we look to the causes in the region's level, the most important factor is we need more integration comprehensively, a comprehensive integration among the countries in the region. Maybe it is a wish, and we are talking about that. But definitely, we are facing with so many barriers and obstacles, either from abroad or within the region. The main obstacle in the region is the imposed regime, which was and is the cause of instability and so many wars which was imposed to the region and the latest one to Lebanon suffering of the people lack of moral approach killing the innocent people Iran was always a part of solution in the region and we have tried our best and we do believe that either in the field of political mm -hmm. and security matters or in the field of economic cooperation mm -hmm. we have a lot to do which I'm not going to go in details in this part of my and, and I hope that we will go into some details after everybody's opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister Bahid, uh, you are the host in uh, this uh, wonderful gathering, uh, but your country is also very preoccupied with something that's going on regionally, which is the, inter the, the peace process, the Arab initiative. You and Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and UAE and others are trying to move that forward. The problem is that you um, are not having much reaction from the Israelis in terms of putting their own peace plan on the table. Another problem is that sitting to your left right there, um, a major regional player, Iran, does not believe in a two-state solution unless the minister wants to correct me on that. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, is, is this just going at it once again or is, do you have a different plan? Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We understand it that way, that uh, the consequences of the 1948 and 1967 wars are the problems now we are facing, and several United Nations Security Council have been uh, uh, adopted with every expectation that their implementation would resolve the problems that these wars have created. Now, uh, the international community failure to implement those uh, this is a clear indictment of our past efforts, but we, I will say that pointing fing fingers yani, serves no useful purpose, but determining how and uh, why this happened does. Actually, all the effort to implement all those decisions uh, have been uh, without really a clear uh, strategy to implement them. They have been uh, devised in a conceptual vacuum. Uh, now. The problem with this uh, crisis management uh, thing that it, it deals with symptoms, not causes, it germinates, it accumulates to the point where uh, you no longer can uh, manage the crisis, you have to solve them. This is where the way we understand it, that problem solving uh, directly rather than crisis management. Henry Kissinger once said, the United States doesn't have a Middle East 
a strategy. It relies on crisis management. We, what we thought is enough crisis management, we need to address the problems uh, directly. Uh, in fact, we thought uh, if the crisis management is dead, what's the alternative? So it is the problem solving, it is the Arab initiative uh, directly. There is a point that uh, requires a serious note that the crisis that Israel is facing, it's not the threat of its uh, security as a state. The crisis is the personal security of uh, the, its citizens and the, its uh, ability to integrate with the region. So uh, here you have an Arab initiative, you have 22 Arab countries are offering Israel uh, a peace, uh, which is the Arab initiative, of course, and uh, we need to, in fact, when it was launched in, in Beirut and it was upheld later on in Riyadh summit this year, uh, the Arabs in Beirut, uh, uh, they launched the initiative mm -hmm. uh, and they turned their back away. They never been an effort actually to promote it mm -hmm or if you like to interpret it, or to explain it, or to seal it, if you want. And at the same time, unfortunately, in, uh, in Israel, of course, it did not create that debate, that wanted debate among uh, the, uh, the public opinion. So now, this is the offer. We should not shy away from it, uh, because establishing a Palestinian state is of, of a national interest for, every, for Jordan and for the Palestinians. We insist that we should keep on, uh, we should be determined to explain that effort, and that's what His Majesty King Abdullah, uh, working with, of course, uh, like-minded uh, countries in the region, his uh, brothers in King of Saudi, uh, uh, Egyptian president, and so many other leaders in the region, he is trying to push that forward, and he always talked about that a window mm. is uh, getting closer. Right. So let me, stay, let me group it uh, in terms of, if, if I can do that, um, issues. Let's, let's stay on the Palestinian issue, Palestinian-Israeli issue for a minute. Um, that window of opportunity is it really an ad, it, it's addressed to the United States because uh, it, uh, there's an idea in this whole initiative that the U.S. would be a major player and it will have to be the catalyst of making things happen with the Arab Peace Initiative or otherwise. But I think the message from the United States that's coming from different quarters is, we're not interested. We have our problems. Our preoccupation is to get out of Iraq you know, honorably. Um, what if the U.S. bows out of this constant call to come in and fix it on the Palestinian-Israeli issue? Everybody is, I mean, let me start with you, Mr. Prime Minister. Pakistan is involved apparently in the larger offer that if the Israelis take this initiative, Pakistan, Indonesia, Muslim countries will come on board and normalize with Israel as long as the Israelis commit to a final status solution. If the U.S. does not become the trigger, what are you going to do? Ma'am, uh, let me first say that Pakistan's position on the Palestinian issue is in total support of King Abdullah's plan, which he issued in Beirut at the Arab summit. And uh, what was echoed by King Abdullah of Jordan also or fits into that overall plan. Having said that, I think your question is an interesting one, that if the U.S. decides not to move or gets gridlocked, what do we do? I think part of diplomacy is to, as I said earlier, bring all the visible and invisible stakeholders at the table. If the U.S., which I don't think they would do, if the U.S. takes the back seat, then we will have to convince them to come in because the U.S. is a big global power. You cannot expect a sustainable solution without the U.S. being involved. But the Not question just is that if you don't I, convince yes, them. Yes, may I? They, will, they are also very close to Israel. There's a strategic partnership there. I think everybody knows that. So if they decide not to come in, then it is probably because it, there is some way they could support Israel by not coming in. Having said that, 
many of us are convinced that the solution of the Palestinian issue goes way beyond the Middle East. It is one of the root causes of terrorism, extremism, discontent, and a feeling in the Muslim world that issues which relate to the Ummah don't get resolved. So I think the U.S. can be convinced and should be convinced. And then you say, okay, now if the U.S. is convinced, let's bring all the visible and invisible stakeholders on the table. And you cannot get into the room with the premise that we will not allow ABC to come. When reality is staring you in the face, when stakeholders who are visible or invisible are staring you in the face, how can you go into a denial mode? So it must be inclusive, you must get people in, and we must convince all. May I mention here Russia too? Yes. Russia has a major role in the Middle East. We don't talk about Russia when we talk about a Middle East solution. We should. Well, we do. We talk about the quartet, and uh, Russia yeah. is involved in the quartet, quartet so the United Nations is, and the yeah. EU. And then the EU. Right. So we have many stakeholders. Right. The quartet is, of course, uh, uh, playing a role. Right. But my point is, let's bring everybody in. And there is no option but to involve the key stakeholders talking for a sustainable about, solution. Talking about bringing everybody in, uh, Minister Muttaqi, uh, is Iran in? Is Iran a supporter of the Arab Initiative uh, of a solution, a two-state solution? In looking to the history of different initiatives, we can recognize more than 130 plan for peace since last 30 years. The question is, why all of these plans and initiatives could not meet, could not realize? Despite of the goodwill of some parties, some countries, to protect the right of the Palestinian, we do believe that either due to, to the plans or due, the, due to the other side's approach, all those plans were failed. If we talk based on realities, I do not see any chance for the three important elements which were mentioned in this plan. Not uh, for the capital of the Palestine, no for the returning of the refugees, which stand up to five million Palestinians, and no the other part of the plan, mm -hmm. due to the other side's approach. Our position in this issue is well known by all the countries and in the region. We do not recognize the regime legally. We, we do not consider as a legal regime, legitimate regime. But at the same time, we have the plan to, to solve the problem basically, based on justice, based on the right of all peoples in the region, inside the Palestine, but the original Palestinians. That's so, why we have offered, the, the last sentence, we have offered a democratic, free and fair referendum through participation of all Palestinians, either inside Palestine or the refugees, either Muslim, Jewish, Christian, who are originally Palestinian, then they choose their regime. Yesterday, uh, uh, Saeb Arakat, uh, of course, the Palestinian representative, said to one of your countrymen, he said that Mr. Larijani, who was the brother of uh, uh, Ali Larijani, and he said to him at an open meeting here yesterday, he said, sir, please, we need help from Iran by putting Palestine on the map, not by calling for removing Israel from the map. And uh, he says, please respect us Palestinians, our options, our choices. 
uh, some, in a way, you're not saying that you respect their options and choices. In a way, it's a one-upmanship in, in effect. The Palestinians are choosing a two-state solution. The Arabs are, and you're saying, well, it's not going to work because we don't like it. The primary students, the primary school students also knows that it is not possible to remove any country from the map. And that is very clear. And already I have explained for you the political plan which we have in our mind. And uh, we are not talking about eliminating of any nation or any country. And uh, we, we do believe that without attaching to the justice, no plan will be realized. Uh, uh, just because I want to move on to other issues, uh, Prince Turkey or, or uh, Sheikh Salman, uh, do, do, do you want to come in quickly on this? Can you, Prince Turkey, let me give it uh, a chance with you. This is an Arab initiative, yet it is, you know, it came out of Saudi Arabia and it has the weight of Saudi Arabia for marketing it as well. If you don't have Iran on board, is this going to complicate your efforts? The reality says that Iran should be on board. The wishful thinking says, why should they? This is an Arab issue. This is a Palestinian issue. It should be solved within the Arab-Palestinian context. Unfortunately, it is, as I mentioned before, the Palestinian scene itself lends itself to outside interference. If our Palestinian brothers, from the very beginning, had been united, we would not be in the position that we, w we are facing today. And even today, when there is this peace initiative relaunched by the Arab League summit in Riyadh, we see our Palestinian brothers killing each other. Mm. How are we going to get anywhere, whether with the Americans, with the Israelis, or with the Iranians, or with anybody else who wishes to interfere into these matters? And it is this that I think makes it imperative that, as I said, we reacquire our fate in our own hands. Let me put, uh, before I put Iraq on the table for discussion, President Karzai, I don't know which is more frightening internationally, the breakdown of Afghanistan or the breakdown of Iraq. I don't know what your thoughts are. Of course, obviously, your priority should be Afghanistan. What if there is a fatigue, international fatigue, from the international community coming in and helping out? What if NATO says, I'm tired of bailing you out? What happens? What do you do? Well, ma'am, before I go to um, Afghanistan and Iraq, let me speak for a second on Palestine. Please. Uh, for us as Muslims, and then within Muslims for the Arab world, it is extremely important to first have an idea and an understanding among ourselves as Muslims and as Arabs as to what is it that we are seeking. We are seeking an independent Palestinian state with the full rights of the Palestinian people guaranteed with their life as a sovereign country. How do we achieve that? Do we achieve that by also granting the same to the Israeli people? Or do we achieve it by other means? Once we have done that, once we have created an environment of understanding among ourselves, then the rest of the world can be asked to come on board. There is no way, as His Highness Prince Turk Al Faisal said, that we can have the rest of the world involved if we are bickering among ourselves. If I were to offer a, a suggestion, I would say that we must all get behind Khadim Harman Sharifain's plan, bring in Iran as well, as a Muslim, as a neighbor, in the rest of us, and get real with our lives, 
and with our sufferings and try to end it. Other than that, we'll be talking another 50 years and the sufferings of the Palestinians will continue. On Afghanistan, ma'am, Afghanistan uh, did not suffer of its own making. Afghanistan began to suffer with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan by the communists trying to, with the help of the Soviets, uh, imposing an alien thought on a deeply believing Muslim population, on a traditional people. We began to fight them for the liberation of our country, for the protection of our religion. The rest of the world came to join in. The West came, the Americans came in, the regional countries came in, the, the Arab world, the Muslims came in, joined us. In resisting the Soviets, the rest of the world tried to use the other extreme in fighting the Soviets. And it was the other extreme that after the Soviets left, and the West left as well, Afghanistan was left at the mercy of a regional play. Mm -hmm. And the regional play brought the destruction and the misery that we saw in Afghanistan from uh, 1992 till 2001. Now, we in Afghanistan knew very well what was going on. We knew the full strength and length and depth of the extremist play in Afghanistan, of uh, the arrival of terrorist bases in Afghanistan, of an effort to try to turn Afghanistan into a place from where terrorism would be exported. Mm -hmm. And we, on a weekly basis, ma'am, informed the international community. I personally did it together with my friends. From 1996 to 2001, nobody cared because Afghanistan had nothing to sell to the rest of the world and Afghanistan had nothing to buy from the rest of the world. It was the poorest of the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we were forgotten by the Muslim world and the rest of the international community till New York was struck. And only then did the world wake up after they had suffered to free us from the misery. The international community has a choice here. Do they want to have a safer world? They must secure Afghanistan fully. The region has a choice here. Our neighbors, especially Pakistan and Iran, have a choice here. Do they want to live in peace and prosperity with a prospering Afghanistan, or do they want to suffer the consequences? So if they leave before time, they will suffer. If they don't, they will prosper. So you think this applies also to Iraq? Now, Iraq is a very different case, ma'am. Uh, Okay, I guess I have good reaction uh, yeah. here. All right. Here, 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 here I can, here, uh, uh, with, the Iraqis, with the Iraqis, perhaps the Afghans are the only people, perhaps the Afghans and the Palestinians are the only people who understand the sufferings of the Iraqis. Uh, the loss of life, the loss of families, the loss of children, the loss of um, livelihoods. Uh, I would wish that we all join hands as Muslims. And especially, I would call on, the, uh, on our Arab brothers to take a much deeper look into helping Iraq return to peace. I don't think we can expect, one of our problems is that we always are looking far beyond our borders for solutions. And that is causing us more troubles. Mm -hmm. um, again, back to you, uh, Foreign Minister Muttaki. Sorry, I keep coming back to you because uh, Iran keeps uh, coming up in the issues of Iraq as well. Uh, it, basically, if you look at it, the United States did you a very big favor. They got rid of Taliban on one side of your borders. They got rid of Saddam on the other side. Well, you know, I mean, you should be good friends with them, in effect. Exactly. When are you meeting, by the way? That's <laughs> They are doing, you know. We suspect they are dealing behind doors. That's what, is that, tell, us what's, tell us what's happening behind the doors. Do you want, Mr. Minister, do you want a premature U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, or does that frighten you because you will inherit it? In effect, the Americans would have broken it, and then you would have owned it. The question is not that much simple, ma'am. Uh, if you don't go a little bit in details, 
Not too, not too much. Not because too we've got, much. You know, all right. I'm, just, under, I'm under the whip here. All right. Just four years ago, three months after occupation of Iraq, which everybody maybe was satisfied because of falling a dictator in Iraq, Saddam Hussein. Nobody was. Uh, and after three months, Mr. George Bush, on a warship, made an interview that the mandate is over. Nobody was expected that hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, children, women, and men, will be killed. During these four years, so many in the region insisted that some part of the policies are wrong. And nobody could hear. Finally, the American people themselves said these policies are wrong by their voting mm -hmm. in their general election based on Baker Hamilton's report it was expected that very soon Mr. Bush administration tries to change the policies the failed policies in Iraq nowadays we hear that they are going to, to implement some part of the Baker Hamilton's report to have connection with the regional countries. They have requested officially to talk mm -hmm. with uh, Iranians and uh, this was what they have requested one year ago due to their approach on a propaganda based approach I mean we have not opened that negotiation but this time in continuation of our support, support to Iraqis people Iraqis government we have ac accepted next week 28th of May in the ambassadorial level the talk will take place we hope they be serious to correct their policies and we are going to explain for them where they have been wrong and how they should correct those policies. Mm -hmm. We are a country in the region, we, we move through the realities, we see the situation and we hope this kind of analysis to the situation be uh, useful for those who are looking for the stability in the region, as yep. well as Afghanistan and the other part of the region. So you will support the Iraqi government when it says we're not interested in a calendar and a deadline for the pullout of the American forces. You say you want to support the Iraqi government. Do you support them on that? There are two basic problems in Iraq. The first problem is uh, instability based on terrorist activities. And the second part of the problem is continuation of occupation of this country. We do believe that any comprehensive solution to this problem should catch both sides of the problem. That's why I have mentioned in Sharm sheikh in my statement that it is expected that the Americans uh, offer a plan of withdrawal, a plan of withdrawal. I'm not going to details. This is our position, and we do believe that sooner or later they have to, to decide to withdraw their troops from Iraq because that is a cause for continuation of terrorist activities. Unfortunately, the, the uh, countries who have occupied Iraq are saying that because of terrorist, terrorists, we are here. And the other side says, because of occupation, we are continuing our activities here. I want to have 
probably six minutes, and I want to get everybody a chance to say something, and I will go back this way. I'll stay with you, Mr. Mutaki. People say about Iran, too much interference in regional affairs, not only Iraq, not only Palestine, but also Lebanon. Some are saying to Iran, hands off Lebanon, support the state, not the militias. Are you ready to do that? As I mentioned, Iran was and is always a part of solution to the crisis in the region. We have been in contact with the government of Lebanon. We are in contact with the government of Iraq, Afghanistan. We do believe that we should support the government in Iraq. We should support the government of President Karzai in Afghanistan. And we are doing our best in Lebanon also. We do believe that any solution should come among the Lebanese groups. And nobody should impose any solution against the Lebanese people. They uh, have to decide. But the countries in the region, they can help to bring close and closer different opinion of different uh, parties in Lebanon. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why in our connection with the other uh, major countries in the region and, and all the countries in the region, particularly uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We had several rounds of uh, negotiation together how we can help our Lebanese brother to, to come to an end for the crisis which they are, fa they are facing uh, with that. And the last one was uh, my, my meeting and the negotiation with uh, my brother Amir Saud al Faisal uh, two weeks ago in Sharm el Sheikh, and we are continuing this kind of our mm -hmm. constructive efforts. Uh, Sheikh Salman, uh, we are, I'm sorry, we are running out of time, but I, I am very curious about your thoughts of what you had heard for the last few minutes. Uh, and, and what, you make, make your choice because I need to <laughs> okay. make customize my choice. on time. Sorry about that. I will say very simply, uh, the solutions that take in some parties will always fail. The solutions that we need to consider must take in the majority, if not all, of the parties, whether that includes Palestine, Iraq, or Iran. But I would like to say one thing about Iranian foreign policy, and that is that your national security should be guaranteed in partnership with your neighbors, not at their expense. So I look forward to the day when we can work together uh, as a region, cooperatively, in order that we build a better future for all of our people. And I wish you well and a success in your future meetings with the United States. That applies to all the countries and their neighbors. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's very optimistic, too. Uh, uh, Prince Turkey? On Iraq, I think there are definitive steps that can be taken. First step is that the United Nations Security Council must pass a resolution under Chapter 7 declaring the territorial integrity of Iraq at any expense, meaning that any portion of Iraq that decides to leave Iraq will not be recognized or dealt with or in any way or manner or form. Any country that has territorial ambitions in Iraq no. will also will not be allowed to achieve those ambitions. Second, when I was ambassador in the United States, I always used to say that America came into Iraq uninvited. It must not leave Iraq uninvited. This is the time to invite the United States to leave Iraq. And <clears throat> The responsibility for uh, pursuing the United Nations Security Council resolution that I mentioned before should fall into the uh, availability of forces from the international community led by the United States outside Iraqi territory. The United States has base rights in many countries in the area they can withdraw their forces to these countries and joined by other forces from the Arab and outside the Arab world be available to protect the territorial integrity of, of Iraq. Mm. 
and let the Iraqi people inside Iraq deal with their problems without interference from outside. On Palestine, I think our Palestinian brothers have to stop fighting. Mm -hmm. Not only do they have to stop fighting from each other, but I would call on them also to stop fighting the Israelis in military terms. You cannot beat the Israelis in military terms. Take up civil disobedience. Follow the Gandhi method, and you will get what you want in Palestine. Thank you very much. 30 seconds each, please, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I'm sorry, I beg your... Thank you, ma'am. 30 seconds each, because... I'll... Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. I will just say a couple of things. One, the Muslim Ummah needs unity. All countries and disputes must have domestic unity and have one platform to create an environment for solution of disputes. Second, we must have, as we said earlier, inclusiveness get everybody on the table and try to bring them together. Third, give people a sense of hope. We are focusing a lot, correctly I think, on dispute resolution and diplomacy. At the same time, let's not forget the people who don't have a meal to eat, mm -hmm. who don't have a job, whose children are sick, whose children don't have education. In Palestine's situation, for example, the least we can do is give them a chance to have a better life and give them a sense of hope. So uh, the other area is resolution of disputes plus improvement of the standard of living of the people is a major priority. The dispute resolution paradigm must be homegrown. But let's not get paranoid. If others have a view and an influence and a role, bring them into in the spirit of inclusiveness. Two thank seconds. you. Thank for you, me. sir. Two seconds. Uh, right? are, are you going to be my conclusion because you, you're the host country. Uh, to, to, uh, please, um, President Karzai, 30 seconds for your input and then I'm going to go to our host. 30 to seconds. Uh, uh, I will go to uh, our brothers in Palestine. I would remind them that uh, infighting between our brothers in Palestine would cause them exactly what infighting caused in Afghanistan. When we defeated the Soviets in 1992 and took power as the Mujahideen government of Afghanistan, it was infighting that caused more destruction to Afghanistan than the Soviet invasion. So my plea is not to do that and learn from the miseries of Afghanistan and from the benefits of Afghanistan today that the country is united and moving towards a better future. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for your patience. I, I guess because you're my partner here, because you're the host country. So thank you for your, well, your thank patience. Thank you for the five seconds you are giving me. I would say this with uh, due respect to Mr. Muttaki when he said 130 plans. Actually, probably he refers to 130 United Nations whatever resolution, not plans. To my knowledge, as I follow the Palestinian issue ever since, that this is the first, the Arab Initiative is the first comprehensive a plan that takes into account solving once and for all the Palestinian problem, the dividing Palestine, establishing two, uh, two states living side by side. As the Arabs have decided, the 22 Arab countries, that peace is a strategic choice, uh, they, uh, uh, King Abdullah of Saudi, the Khadim al Haram al-Sharifin, at the time Crown Prince Abdullah, has uh, presented this, the Arabs accepted the... So, for the first time, the Arabs have taken control of the peace agenda in the region. I would say to the Israelis one thing, that Israelis uh, should understand that the Palestinians do not present a threat to them. The Arab states that hold the security, the key, actually the security of Israel, and therefore that's a, a chance they should seize. One last thing on Iraq, I would say the, the problems that Iraq facing at the uh, now and the region should help the Iraqis fighting terrorism and the other thing is disarming militias. This is the, the problem that they are suffering from. Of course, I totally agree that uh, it is our interest in Jordan to have a sovereign uh, territorial integrity Iraq and uh, we wish Iraq every success. We have been uh, actually helping in the political process to include everybody, uh, uh, the major components of the Iraqi 
uh, population. Thank you so much. Well, I thank you very much. I apologize for the audience for not taking questions, but do please join me in thanking very, very warmly this most distinguished thank panel. You. Thank you very much.